being recorded. Hello. Welcome to the next EPTC webinar. I'm really delighted to see so many of you taking the time uh, from, your, from your day to join us. So today I'm uh, delighted to announce the new topic, the new developments in mechanism-driven chemical assessment. And we have uh, two uh, guest speakers uh, accompanying uh, one of the EPTC staff, uh, Sebastian Hoffman. So first, I'm going to remind you what EBTC is. So we are an international collaboration of science, regulatory, and industry leaders um, aimed with developing and coordinating evidence-based transparent toxicology and safety assessment. So the EBTC's vision is uh, that evidence-based toxicology is the standard used to ensure public health, a healthy environment, and sustainable future. It's an open collaboration and uh, anybody is welcome to join and participate in our projects and actually suggest uh, the projects to do uh, collaboratively. So there are uh, objectives with BTC are grouped into, into four uh, pillars. So one is uh, raising research standards. Um, second is making sense of evidence, improving access to research and advocating evidence-based decision-making. So today, our talk is in the second pillar, is make, making sense of evidence, uh, which includes the systematic reviews and evidence maps. So some of the examples of what we do is applying systematic methods to development of adverse outcome pathways, which is actually going to be partially uh, addressed in today's, uh, in today's workshop, in today's uh, webinar, working with editors to improve uh, publishing standards around systematic reviews, evaluating alternative non-animal test methods for drug-induced liver injury, and uh, finally updating Bradford Hill's concept of biological plausibility, uh, which uh, has just been, uh, been published actually as a grade uh, concept paper. So the EBTC network is uh, very wide. We have uh, members in, uh, in over 20 different countries uh, spread on uh, all continents except for Africa, but we're working on that. Um, so the, uh, the EPTC network uh, working groups, uh, again, are formed, uh, uh, formed in, uh, uh, organized into the, the pillars uh, and the, uh, the pillars of our research. And there are some of the, some of the groups and projects are listed here. And you can learn more on our website. So uh, the group is run by, uh, by a small staff, uh, which is myself. I'm the executive director, um, Marty Stevens, uh, Sebastian Hoffman, and Paul Whaley. Uh, we also have uh, important input from our board um, and uh, scientific advisory council. So we're trying to be very diverse and inclusive and uh, try to uh, assure that we have, um, we have input from all our stakeholders. This is, uh, these are the sources of our funding. Some of it is in-kind um, as companies provide their, um, their software, their resources, or some of their staff's time to, to work on, on the projects run by EBTC. As I said, you know, we are open collaboration. You're free to join please email us and we actually will have a sign up uh, web form very soon on our website. So again, today's webinar is new developments in mechanism driven chemical assessment. Uh, the logistics, first of all, so the, the three 15 minute presentations, we you're welcome to put your post questions in Q&A. Uh, we will reserve 10 minute panel discussion uh, for your questions at the very end but please be aware that we have a hard stop at 10.55. So the webinar uh, will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. So on to you, Sebastian. Um, thanks, Katya. <clears throat> I'm um, Sebastian Hoffman, also of the EBTC uh, staff, as you've heard, and I'm going to set the scene for the two more um, detailed and probably more interesting talks that are going to follow by our in invited speakers. Um, let me share my screen. And 
start the presentation. So around the topic of today's webinar, um, we as a collaborative organization had organized two workshop uh, in the pre uh, COVID-19 area in, in 2019, and I'm, I'm going just to set the scene and and, and give you um, a taste of what we have discussed there. And as I said, um, our two invited speakers will then go into, into more details uh, in, in two or, or some of the aspects we discussed at the workshops. Um, so the, the history goes back about five years um, when we, together with the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA, organized a joint colloquium um, which was held in Lisbon in, in Portugal. And this was around the science of combining apples, apples and oranges um, as yeah, to be, uh, on, on, the, on the topic, in fact, how um, to integrate evidence from various data sources in, in risk assessment. And one of the recommendations of that colloquium was that there's a need for a cross-discipline interaction to facilitate mutual understanding and to create opportunities for work on key domain subjects. And a specific example was uh, the adverse outcome pathway to the AOP, which um, we, we picked this recommendation up and, and organized about two years later in 2019, two workshops. Uh, I'm going only to briefly introduce the first, especially as we have been five minutes taken away at the end of our, um, of our webinar due to technical reasons. So the first workshop was held as a, a great pre-meeting. Uh, the great working group, if you're not familiar with this, they have a clinical background and their, their um, uh, grading evidence and uh, until the end and how to, to best make decision out of evidence. Um, so you see there, there were about 30 participants. Um, mainly from the EBT community, but also those uh, attending the great meeting interested in, our, interested in our topic. So very much from a clinical background. Um, just some highlights of that, that workshop. Um, so there was agreement that systematically and transparently assembled literature could support the assessment of certainty in adverse outcome pathways. Um, then as in the clinical field, automated text mining machine learning tools could speed up uh, systematic reviewing of, of the literature and, and systematic mapping. Um, the, the great framework to assess certainty and evidence could be adapted to, to our field. Um, and actually it is, as Katja showed earlier, um, we have, for example, looked at biological plausibility in, in a great context. Um, with the two um, communities represented there, uh, one, one key barrier was the communication. So we really had um, we spent some time to get the terminology between the clinical and, and our field straight. However, there was the common agreement that uh, collaboration should be inspired and, and co to collectively advance the field. Um, the, the workshop has been reported in Altex, uh, I think in last year, I will later post the um, DOIs. It's an open access report. Just a few months later, we met again, um, and this time again, a, a, an event organized together with EFSA. Um, so we were at their premises in, in Parma, Italy, and, and we wanted to deepen some of the discussions of the first workshop, and in, in particularly to explore the integration of evidence-based approaches with mechanistic evidence evaluation in chemical risk assessment. And, and in Parma, we worked on three related themes. Um, first, assessing certainty in mechanistic constructs such as AOPs, then literature-based development of mechanistic pathways, and also on integrating certainty in mechanistic con constructs and certainty in numb evidence populating those contexts into decision framework use frameworks used by, by regulators. Again, uh, the workshop report has been published in Altex Open Access. Before I go to the, uh, to the summary of, of the workshop, let me briefly disclaim that this is only um, a part of the workshop and I subjectively uh, selected topics uh, that more relate to 
to our discussions today. Some of the content ha has been adjusted to better fit today's topic. And um, as I said, the workshop used the AOP as an example, but I, I think um, all the, the challenges and, and recommendation equally apply to any other mechanistic concept, such as mode of action or, or key characteristics. And for example, key characteristics will be the topic uh, of our next um, talk by Xavier Azuaga. So um, I have now on, on each of the themes, I have just a few highlights I would like to present to, to set the scene. So on the first theme, assessing certainty in mechanistic constructs, um, it was uh, pointed out that those constructs are meant to inform regulatory decisions and not necessarily fully describe the biolo biology of an exposure outcome relationship. Um, it was mentioned or it was pointed out that modified breath for till consideration are very helpful to analyze mechanistic constructs, uh, especially they help to facilitate the uncertainty assessment of the relationships of key events to be used in the regulatory context. And in fact, the Breck for till consideration are used in order to derive um, the certainty of key event relationships, um, so-called the, um, and the essentiality of, of the key events. So this reflected in the pluses here of this, of this uh, hypothetical AOP um, at the bottom of the slide. Um, one of the challenges uh, identified there is that the application of evidence-based methods to mechanistic constructs is, is really problematic due to differences in research, research context, vocabulary used, and, and the reasoning processes. And in order to address that, it was recommended to translate processes and vocabulary in order that the lessons from evidence-based approaches and the, the AOP community or the mechanistic uh, construct community uh, can be fully applied to the other. Uh, this would be worthwhile in, in proceeding to get the, the two fields closer together because of the inherent um, transparency of evidence-based approaches, um, stakeholder trust could be built in implementation of mechanistic construct into chemical risk assessment. Then the second theme was around literature-based development of mechanistic pathways. And, and the next talk will go in some more detail on this topic. So some highlights of, of this discussion were that, um, um, th that once you have a construct, there's still the problem of how well um, the parts or the event of your mechanistic construct can be measured. Um, it was pointed out that the strength of evidence uh, can support causal relationship. So the more the, the more the more evidence you have, the consistency of that evidence, and also the human relevance really can can support uh, causality in your relationships. And it was uh, pointed out that if you want to do a risk assessment as compared to a hazard assessment, some quantitative understanding is a prerequisite. And this figure here at the bottom was developed by that theme. And you see, um, this is again focused on, on evidence uh, and address outcome pathways that starting with the search term, you can with the type of evidence mapping, get some first structure into the events leading to an adverse outcome. You could do that in an iterative process. And then once you're sufficiently um, settled on this, you can then probe or, or determine really the relationship and the uh, certainty in those relationships with the systematic review approaches, either on the whole pathway or just on, on pieces you think are, are most relevant. Uh, a fundamental challenge which we, um, which was identified there, but which we hear uh, relatively often is that the time required to conduct full evidence mapping systematic reviews is often prohibitive. And in order to address those challenges, there were the the recommendation of using advanced tools such as, as text mining and, and artificial intelligence machine learning to facilitate reviews and and we will hear more about that in our last talk today um, you could also focus on the most relevant parts of your construct and not probe everything and it was also pointed out that a thorough problem formulation um, including the assessment of resources and goal is really pivotal 
in order to um, develop and establish an approach to in interrogate parts of an entire, uh, interrogate parts or entire mechanistic construct. The last theme was around integrating certainty in mechanistic construct and non-evidence, so new approach methodology evidence, uh, populating those mechanistic constructs into decision frameworks. And as a working example, we took uh, in IATA, the IATA framework of the OECD as a decision framework where you formulate your problem, gather information, do in weight of evidence of that information, potentially identify gaps, generate more information, and then do again a weight of evidence in order to come to a regulatory decision. And then we, the, the mechanistic constructs or the AO, AOP, as, as discussed in, in the workshop, is related mainly mostly to the weight of evidence assessment because it provides some kind of structure in which to organize the evidence you collected, but it also helps you to identify the information gaps, which you or, or gaps in, in, in confidence in, in some of the information. So this then would lead to generation of new data. And, and moving away from animal experimentation into the uh, into towards NUM, so new approach methodology probably you would use these type of methods in the future in order to um, fill gaps and increase confidence. The problem at the bottom here is that you have uh, some kind of confidence in your mechanistic construct and some kind of confidence in your, uh, in your norms. And, and the challenge here is really how to integrate the two types of, um, of confidence. Um, these challenges were identified and uh, as harmonizing and transparently assessment of the measurement of the uncertainty in mechanistic events and the num, uh, the num approaches informing them. And even, even going a step further, the challenge will be in the future, if we come to num and mechanism-based chemical risk assessment, we probably need to rethink our current uh, chemical risk assessment practices um, as we are moving away from adverse outcomes um, by animal experiments. And with that, I hope I provide an introduction uh, which our ne next speaker can pick up. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Um, so I go ahead, Sebastian. Yes. Excellent. Do you, right, let me please introduce, briefly introduce yourself. Yes, yes. Let me just share my screen first and put up my slides. Um, all right. Um, are you able to see the slides? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. I hope you're having a great Tuesday and uh, that you enjoyed the summer as well. Have some time to take off and, and enjoy the warm weather. Um, my name is Xavier Arzuaga. I work in the US Environmental Protection Agency, specifically the Office of Research and Development. And within that, I work in um, the development of iris toxicological reviews, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about as I as I go through my presentation. Um, before I go ahead, um, just have to do this quick disclaimer. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the author, myself, Xavier, and do not necessarily represent the views or policies of the US Environmental Protection Agency. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, I work in Irish toxicological reviews. Um, these are dossiers where we look at the hazards to human health that can be posed by individual chemicals or groups of chemicals, mixtures. And um, as, a as a toxicologist, um, most of what I focus on is um, looking at toxicological, but also mechanistic evidence. And um, often we find in, in IRIS tox reviews that we have generous databases or lots of studies identified in um, in, in our literature, in our systematic review uh, literature searches. In the case of TOX, these can be pretty complex, not just a large number of studies. Um, you have studies with a diverse uh, experimental, diversity in experimental models, different species, strains of animals, different types of exposure regimens and or exposure routes. 
also a variety of outcome measures to look at particular um, health hazards. Um, it could be also different variations of the chemical, like different congeners, or in the case of mixtures, could be uh, different components in, in a particular chemical mixture. So all of this adds complexity and can be kind of challenging navigating a large database that has uh, such diversity. Uh, and for me, at least, it's difficult to keep track of all, all of that. Um, so one way that, that we deal with um, these large and complex databases is that we developed um, evidence inventories or systematic review inventories, um, which I just simply call them inventory. And for toxicological studies, what we try to capture is information on the citation, author, publication year, et cetera. So pretty simple stuff. Also, very importantly, um, experimental design features. Um, in the case of in vivo studies, things like exposure and route of, 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 of exposure, species and strain of animals used to test compound, um, the age or life stage, or whether it was a developmental exposure or chronic, so chronic exposure, et cetera. And then we also capture information on the outcomes reported in the study and the studies. In the case of male reproductive toxicity, we rely pretty heavily on our own EPA guidelines on reproductive assessment, reproductive toxicology uh, assessment. Those were published in 1996. And the its description of outcomes that are commonly reported in um, in reproductive toxicity studies, in this case, um, male reproductive toxicity. So stuff like organ weight changes, histopathology, sperm measures, hormone measures, et cetera. Um, so that's all really nice to develop an inventory for tox outcomes, but for mechanistic outcomes, it, and what we noticed early on is that it was a bit more challenging to do that and capture that kind of information in, in our inventories. And in our earlier attempts, we would just start labeling things as, or endpoints as mechanistic in, in our inventories. Very quickly, we realized that that wasn't going to work, that that was just going to generate a large list of outcomes that were not related to each other. And it would be difficult to navigate through, through such an inventory. At the time, two of my colleagues, Dr. Vince Cogliano and Dr. Catherine Gibbons introduced me to uh, the key characteristics of carcinogens. And um, it was very tempting to apply uh, the key, car key car cases of carcinogens to uh, an inventory I was working on at the time that was focused on male reproductive toxicity. However, we realized at the time that, uh, that there were some aspects unique to uh, the database that we were working on. There is some overlap between the KCs of carcinogens and some of the general mechanisms or pathways for male reproductive toxicity. But in the end, we concluded that it was better to come up with a list of mechanistic outcomes or categories, something that we, you could, we could use to organize the database and it was more focused on male reproductive toxicity. We were fortunate that we were able to work with Martin Smith and others at a workshop at UC Berkeley in March of 2018. And the result of that workshop was that we identified what we call now the eight key characteristics of male reproductive toxicants. This includes germ cell alterations, somatic cell effects, um, hormone um, alterations or changes in hormone production or levels, alterations or changes in hormone receptors, either at the level of expression or function, genotoxicity, epigenetic changes, oxidative stress, and inflammation. So we published that paper in 2019. It was all really nice to have that approach. But the next thing is that we wanted to try it out and do a case study um, and see how it would work in a, in a more practical way and working with an actual group of studies and looking at tox and mechanistic outcomes. So we chose to focus on benzoipyrene. Um, part of the reason why we chose benzoipyrene is because there's lots of studies on this chemical, it's well known, and there's also an Irish toxicological review that was published in 2017 and considered um, mechanistic evidence on BAP-induced male reproductive toxicity. So it gave us a reference point or something to look at and kind of keep a check on what we were doing and uh, and and notice any similarities or differences. So we performed a literature search focusing on male reproductive toxicity 
And we applied the KCs to screen um, the studies that we identified in the literature search, also develop inventories, and what we're doing right now, which is evaluating the mechanistic and toxicological evidence. We identified over 2,000 citations in our initial literature search uh, and using Swift Active Screener and Distiller, we did our title last and abstract and full text screening. And right now we have over 64, over 60 citations that are, that are included in our inventory. Um, developing the inventory was kind of a tedious thing as a lot of studies to consider and extract information. But once you have it developed, it's pretty easy um, and, and practical to navigate through that database according to the KCs themselves or the categorization for tox outcomes or other aspects that we collected, species strain, exposure route, exposure duration, et cetera. And here I'm just breaking down what's in the inventory according to the eight key characteristics of male reproductive toxicants. Um, so as you can see, most of the studies report that report that are available report on things like germ cell alterations, oxidative stress, and, and genotoxicity. Um, diving a little bit more in detail into what's captured within each KC, I brought you a couple of examples. So for oxidative stress, uh, what's captured in the inventory is studies both in vivo and in cell culture using different species of, of animals as well as human uh, uh, in cell culture model and uh, looking at um, oxidative stress measures, either production of ROS or markers of oxidative stress. And most of them, the studies report increased oxidative stress in a variety of cell types and tissues in the male reproductive system. Another interesting aspect that we collected in our inventory is whenever there was an in, uh, intervention study, we tried to capture that there as well. And the studies available report that co-exposure to either antioxidants or aryl hydrocarbon inhibitors seem to ameliorate these effects. Um, here, just looking a bit more in detail into studies reporting on hormone effects. Um, so again, a variety of experimental models, both in vivo and cell culture, all reporting that exposure to BAP can decrease testosterone production as well as uh, altering levels of other reproductive hormones. And again, intervention studies seem to suggest that co-exposure to antioxidants or AHR inhibitors seem to ameliorate these effects. Lastly, I wanted to mention that we also borrowed uh, one of the cases from the list of female reproductive um, key, key characteristics. That's the one for signal transduction. And the reason why we did that was that a lot of um, cell signaling and, and uh, evidence that we captured in our inventory was all being captured into this one KC for somatic cell effects. And we're noticing that it was a lot of studies and endpoints captured in there that were very diverse. And we wanted to have something more nuanced to, to capture some of the cell signaling pathways um, that are reported in the, the available study. So we borrowed this KC and the majority of the studies there report that uh, as expected exposure to BAP activates and the aryl hydrocarbon receptor then triggering downstream um, effects. Another aspect that I wanted to mention is that as you look into the evidence available for each of the KCs and sorting it according to species strain, et cetera, you start to notice the association between one KC and the other, oxidative stress leading to disrupted function of lytic cells, resulting in decreased testosterone production, and then that resulting in male repro toxicity. Um, and you start to put these pieces of the puzzle together, if you will. In this next slide, uh, this is a cartoon that we put together and, and using the MOA framework and relying mostly on the uh, summary of mechanistic evidence in the 2017 IRIS Tox Review of BAP and also other um, review papers. And one thing that we started noticing pretty quickly is that as we look into the KCs and look into different pathways and the relationship with each one, these can fall into what you would call key events in an MOA. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is that the KC's approach and, and other um, frameworks such as uh, MO, mode of action analysis are not incompatible and can work in conjunction with, with each other. The KC's just provides us a, a, a way of structuring and organizing uh, a database that we can then evaluate. 
I um, just want to conclude by stating that the KC's approach provides us a, for a tool to navigate um, most of the available evidence, as well as yeah, developing inventories that, that can be useful to, to deal with a com complex database of studies. This also improves transparency. And from a personal level, I'll share that, that it helps me with my job. You know, if I'm looking at a large number of studies, it's a lot easier to have it captured in an inventory than try to remember what was that mouse study that looked into inflammation? Was it Smith et al. 1995 or Rivera et al. 2002? It's, it's just tedious to, to try to remember all of this. So once you have it in an inventory, it's a lot easier to manage a database. I want to say thank you very quickly to my colleagues at EPA, especially Dr. Ingrid Drew and Dr. Bevan Blake, uh, who helped out a lot with the BAPK study. Also from the KC's work room, Dr. Martin Smith and Dr. Gail Prince, they, they played a big role in, in the identification of the eight KC's on male reproductive toxicants. And that's it. Um, very, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Javier. This was, uh, this was very, very interesting work. Thank you so much. So we'll keep the questions for uh, for the end of the uh, the talk and uh, the end of the webinar and move right on to uh, Tom uh, Luchterfeld's um, talk from in silica. Thanks, Kasha. Let me pull it up real quick. Okay, is that showing up? Yep. Okay. So, please introduce yourself briefly. Yeah, I'm Tom Luchterfeld. Uh, I was previously a PhD student at, uh, at CAT, and I still work with CAT part-time, working at Ancelica. Um, we do document review tools and uh, chemical modeling and all that life science informatics type stuff. So in this uh, brief presentation, I'm going to be talking about two methods for harmonizing mechanistic evidence, uh, the topic of this discussion. and. Uh, and I'm a tool builder, so both of these are tools. I uh, want to emphasize that these are open source tools, free and open source tools. So uh, you could download them and rebuild them as you like. Uh, they're both also hypermodular tools, which I'll talk about in a moment. <clears throat> the class of tools we're talking about are data registries. So that's BioBricks. Data registries are a method for pulling data. And I'll talk about how that makes it easier to harmonize data. And then the second tool I'm going to talk about is uh, open source review. Um, or CISREV version control, which is all about making data and making the document review process um, open source, more modular, um, and consistent with linked data principles. All right, so let's jump into Bobricks. Bobricks is a data registry. That means that Bobricks treat, treats databases as uh, in, a, in a similar way to uh, packages. So if anyone in the audience is a developer or you're just familiar with programming, most programming languages have some sort of package man management system. People put a lot of work into building code that does a spe special thing. And then there's a system that allows you to import that code into your own environment. Bobrix does the same thing for data. And this is important because as of a, a, a week ago, there were about 800 public uh, life science databases. So that's way too many databases. Um, so actually, anaconda.com, which is a authority in the Python space, uh, surveyed data scientists and asked them, you know, how much of your time is spent just loading data and cleaning that data, so making that data consistent with your own system. <clears throat> and the answer roughly came back at 45%. So a lot of time is spent on these tedious, error-prone, and redundant tasks of just loading databases and cleaning those databases. Um, and actually, even before you're loading data or cleaning that data, uh, you have to figure out what data to use. So when we're talking about, you know, building uh, building tools from mechanistic evidence, we need to figure out what data sources we're going to use. And if there are over 800 databases, uh, well, that's pretty hard, particularly if each database has its own data loading paradigm uh, and its own data cleaning steps. And it's actually impossible at that point for an individual to get more than, you know, review more than a, a couple, maybe a dozen databases. And that's just for one database. If you want to combine multiple databases, you have this gargantuan task of harmonizing data. So Soren Drakici uh, has a textbook where he makes a poignant statement about this. And that's just that 
informatics tools, bioinformatics tools typically only use a single database. And uh, that's not because there's you know only one good database for any problem. It's because it's really hard to maintain a single data pipeline. If you want to, if you want to harmonize data between multiple databases, it's extremely difficult. So there are two problems with, with this process. There's the problem that's been identified here, and then two more. Uh, discovering data is hard, harmonizing that data hard, is hard, and all of that is made very difficult because it's hard to load data, it's hard to clean data. A solution to this problem uh, is data dependencies or treating data as packages. That's what Bobrix does. So this is, uh, this is work funded by the NSF. <clears throat> so showing is better than telling. So I'm gonna have a very brief coding demonstration here. If you're not a developer, I'm gonna be talking through each step and you should be able to follow along. So I'm gonna load a package, tidyverse, and uh, that's just a common package in R. All these steps work in Python or any other language. Um, and I'm going to set an, a, a directory that contains all of the data dependencies that I've built for this demonstration. I'm going to ask what data dependencies, which databases treated as packages are available on that directory. And you can see databases like the integrated chemistry environment and HGNC. If I want to load one of those databases, I can run one line of code and I can look at that database. HGNC in this case just has one table. And uh, I can look at the top of that table in a line of code. And I can see that there's information about genes, gene symbols, locations, the kind of thing that I would expect to see from HGNC. So this whole process was extremely rapid. Um, we already had, had HGNC installed and pulled, but uh, reviewing HGNC was instantaneous. Uh, you know, there wasn't any clicking around on a website. Uh, this really makes this process much, much faster. Um, but what if we were starting from scratch? You know, it works, of course, if I use a directory where it's already been installed, on line 12, I can restart this process in a temporary directory that's completely empty. I can install the integrated chemistry environment, and I can pull all of the data from the integrated chemistry environment. And all of this data can be loaded in, a, in the exact same method as the HGNC database. I can once again ask what tables are in the ICE database. I get 10 tables back. And now if I want to do some discovery really quick and figure out you know, where is most of the data in the, in the ICE database, I can just count the number of rows in each of those tables. I can see, well, there's, looks like about 10 times more data for the endocrine table than any of the other tables. So that's a pretty interesting table. I happen to know that that table has, uh, has CAS uh, number as one of its columns. So I can ask which CAS number has the most rows of data. This CAS number does. So I might ask, what is that CAS number? And I see it's dihydro Test, testosterone, uh, which maybe isn't a surprise for an endocrine table. So hopefully at this point, it's easy to see how you could, can use Biobricks, a data registry, which is open source. Every brick is open source. You can go and look at all the code for all of this and rebuild it yourself, build your own bricks. Um, you can use this to quickly import and start analyzing data or even build your own databases that depend on multiple other databases. So this is a, re a really nice scalable system for uh, helping you get the data that you want to harmonize. But what about making the data? Uh, so this is where we get into the realm of document review. And uh, before I jump into how open source modular review can help with that, I wanna just think about how do we extend review? Because you see a lot of publications recently and grants and people doing work in industry uh, about taking some sort of process of reviewing something uh, and assigning structured data to that something. You can take the process of finding alternatives for substances in a formulation. Let's say we want to take SLS and find uh, and, and evaluate alternatives for SLS. For some reason, we don't want to use sodium lauryl sulfate. Well, we might run SLS through some machine learning algorithm we have that suggests alternatives. It builds a list of alternatives. We can take those alternatives and run them through databases, PubMed, a database of safety data sheets, some custom database. And then we can have a review process where we extract the normalized hazards for each of those alternatives. So this is just a normalized process where every step can be written in code. And it's sort of reminiscent of what we would do for a systematic review. In fact, we can take the same process and do a different kind of review. You know, maybe we want to extract the images from those publications and you know, look at histological exposure uh, type, uh, type images and figure out you know, what do each of these alternatives do to, let's say, kidney cells. Um, so that's a different review flow on the same chemical entities. Now, both of those might be useful for making a decision about alternatives. They're different review flows. Um, and so we need to have a process of combining the data at the end. 
And if I build the review flow for doing this in PubMed and you build, build the review flow as a developer at a different place for reviewing images, we need to have a common language for combining our data at the end. So that's the idea of linked data. And um, SRVC fully supports linked data. Um, and we'll show that in just a moment. If you get that right, you can combine things like language and images. And uh, that enables all sorts of downstream applications, one of which is building fun um, artificial intelligence models like Dolly, which you may have heard of. Uh, Dolly generates images from text prompts. So it uses text data and images, image data, different modalities, combines them together for training data to build a model that generates images from text prompts. In this case, the prompt was uh, toxicology and document review. I don't know if this is what you think of when you hear that statement, but uh, I don't know, it's somewhat reminiscent to me. So uh, if, if we want a system that enables large numbers of review flows, uh, we wanna talk about how do we support linked data? And then also we need to talk about the feature bottleneck. Uh, so I don't wanna get into too much depth, but there's a real question here with all these existing document review platforms. If you wanna build a new review flow, uh, you can't embed that review flow into Distiller or Covidence or, or Sysrev, which is the one we've built. Um, you just can't, and those are closed source systems. Um, so how do we open those systems up? That's where SRVC comes in. SRVC, Sysrev version control, is just code. So every review is just a Git repository. So it's a, it's a directory with code in it. It's a hypermodular system. So every SRVC is composed of generators, which generate documents. Those are just processes written in any language, Python or R or Clojure or some of the codes written in Rust. Um, so they're composed of generators to generate documents, map stages to review those documents, and a step to store the results. You can git clone a review and run our command line tool SR review to perform that review from anywhere, your laptop, from your own AWS instance, anywhere else. As you perform your review, you're creating data and you wanna be able to sync that data. So SRVC supports the idea of pushing your review data and pulling your review data and syncing uh, streaming, uh, streaming replication. So you can run this whole process in the cloud for users who don't want to have the coding aspect of it, who just want you know, a review flow that they're familiar with. Okay, so I wanna show you a quick live demonstration. In this case, I'm going to be using the SRVC Hello uh, repository. This is an SRVC review, it's open source. You can clone it yourself. I've already cloned it here. You can see that there's a directory, SRVC Hello. If I go to the configuration file, I can see that there are a number of different review flows for SRVC Hello. I can run this simple review flow, which generates documents from a file as a review simple. And I can see that abstracts and titles are populated in a command line review, a simple review. I can start assigning labels to these titles and abstracts. And as I do that, a sync is populated with content hashed objects, JSON linked data consistent objects. If you're familiar with resource description frameworks or ontologies, this, this sync is consistent with ontologies or RDFs. And all this data gets populated as I perform the review. Okay, so that's a command line review. Um, maybe we want something a little more visual. So we could run an annotation review. And in this case, SRVC launches a web browser where we could look at substances. I'm not going to try to do this accurately, just randomly for the example. And this would be sort of like an NER, a named entity recognition review where we're identifying things in text. And you can see as we do that, uh, more answers, labels, and documents are added to our sync that are all able to be linked to any resource. And the final example here, if we wanted to integrate um, machine learning models, uh, we could build a model that identifies chemicals and exposures and uh, phenotypes and so on in text. Uh, so we're using a model built by Mark Dunis at the University of Utrecht. And you can see that his model identifies compounds and uh, exposure routes and so on. And uh, in this review flow, we're just correcting that model. You know, is this correct? Is it incorrect? And all of those, uh, all those evaluations are also stored in the sync. So you can build better machine learning models this way. So we reviewed three different review flows. Hopefully you can see how this open source system will enable people to build better review systems. Will allow people to stop building new review platforms. You shouldn't have to review 20 different, you know, proprietary review platforms to figure out what you need for your use case. There ought to be one open source system where anyone can contribute their own review flows. 
and SRVC supports that. Um, all this work is supported by NIH, NSF, and we're also part of the OnTalks project. Uh, thank you very much. On about a minute over there. Great, thank you, Tom. This was a very interesting talk. Um, good work. So, what uh, would I would like to start with uh, with a couple of questions for Javier. Um, so, there was a question from the audience on. Um, where do you think the majority of future AOPs will be developed? Uh, is it academia, regulators, or industry? And uh, how do you uh, how do you see the incentive system for developing AOPs being developed? Because right now it's sort of a crowdsourcing type effort with uh, people just doing the work that they are maybe they've done their their doctoral work on or whatever. Uh, how do you see this being more systematized? And uh, and encouraged and incentivized. Oh, that's an interesting question because I have not worked on AOPs specifically. So just I guess I can offer in, in a perspective looking from the outside in. I I still see it as more of a collaboration between academia and government. There's definitely a need in government, um, and, and I can say from speak from my experience in our shop to have um approaches or frameworks that can help us um structure evidence obtained through systematic review and and evaluate that and so things like aop's mode of action can definitely be very useful um i i can see myself using an aop that was developed entirely in academia or in government or as a collaboration it, it doesn't um to me it's it's more about the tool itself and how it was um, peer reviewed and 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 um, validated in the end. Um, and I'll just offer on the KCs approach that um, just thinking about MOA AOPs and KCs, um, I found that KCs are most practical when you don't have an existing same mode of action analysis that is similar or an existing AOP and you need to start from somewhere. So it just provides a tool to start organizing and structuring evidence. And then there, the end, it may take the shape of an MOA as, as we're seeing in the case of benzoipyrene. So not very specific, but I hope that offers some perspective. All right, thank you. One, one more question for you. Uh, do you uh, foresee that uh, KCs may be updated or refined, and how do you see that uh, that process being done? Is it also as a collaboration, or you see one group taking the lead? Um, I don't see one group taking the lead. This is actually a conversation that I've had with Martin Smith and and others, because as as you as I mentioned in in our uh, example with benzoid powering, we're finding that that in some cases we needed something more nuanced and we had to borrow from the list of cases of female reprotoxicants. So I don't see, I personally don't see them. And I, don't, I think the KCs community don't, doesn't see them as something that is static. In science, things continue to evolve. And as new evidence, new pathways are discovered, um, there, there's, there will be a need um, to update them. What, how, Form, what form could that be? Um, I don't know, I guess it could be like the shape of a commentary or a publication. In our case, we intend to, to have a section discussing the need uh, to, to do what we did, which is borrowing one of the KCs from, from another list or incorporating that, that aspect in, into the list of KCs from male reprotoxicants. Great. Katya, may, may I add a bit to the to the first point on on incentives and AOPs and who's going to develop them? Um, I'm, <clears throat> I think the, the AOP were primarily develop the concept and, and probably uh, at other mechanistic constructs as well to help um, inform regulatory decisions, be it a prioritization or, or a hazard or risk assessment. Uh, at least that's the AOP uh, OECD background. So a natural answer would be that a lot of, of governments and, and governmental organization would support developing them at least. But I think that's that's not the majority. The majority in, indeed is developed in academia. And there the incentives have been quite low as far as I know. Uh, although I think now uh, at least a couple of 
journals have subscribed to publishing AOPs. Uh, I think that was even difficult uh, some years ago to get a, an AOP work into the public literature. Um, other, another incentive I'm, I'm involved is in is an European uh, project um, on endocrine disruptor. Actually, it's it's eight different projects. Um, at the core of their their work is to develop AOPs, but this really shows shows us how how difficult, how demanding that is. And and we will see in a year or so what really comes out of of out, out of these projects on, on AOP for various endocrine disruptive um, mechanisms. So I think it's it's it, these questions are, are valid and 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 put some, to some extent uh, the fingers into the wound. Um, it, it's a laborious process and and probably incentives and and support is is not sufficient at the moment. Well, it is similar situation in general with uh, evidence generation and systematic reviews as well. There is very little funding and incentive to actually do them. Probably traditionally because it was done by. Uh, by physicians who are interested in finding the best treatments for their patients and some insurance companies and whatnot. And that sort of a, that legacy is, is hanging. But yep. Thank you, Sebastian. This was good, good interjection. Uh, do you want to shoot the next question to Tom? Yeah, yeah. Tom, one, one question that came to my mind is when you shout the bio bricks, um, can does it store the data or can, do you pull the data all the time live from, from the database, from the online databases? How, how does that work? Yeah, so actually every single data dependency, every brick that's part of Biobricks is a GitHub repository. So the code for building that data resource is all open source. Anyone can go look at it. Anyone can contribute to it. Um, so. First off, that's just how building the resource works. And we try to stay very close to the data that's actually served by the authority. Um, after that data pipeline step is completed, all of that data is stored currently on Amazon S3 um, and it's stored using a hashing method. I won't get into the technicals, but uh, in that way, when you run, uh, when you pull the data, you're not hitting um, PubMed or, you know, or ICE or any of the other authorities. Uh, so we're not adding load to their systems. We're actually paying for the bandwidth for people to download that data themselves. Uh, so every time that data pipeline is run, the data is stored and cached on Amazon S3. You're thinking about other systems for that, but you can happily install a brick and download it, you know, as often as you like. That's how it works. Thanks. J just one follow-up question to see if I got it right. I'm 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 quite familiar with. Uh, I see, or I use that um, every now and then. But I always get nervous when there's a new announcement of the next update. So yeah. whenever there's an update, you would then once connect, download the new data onto your servers and, and use it from there. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, so basically every brick uh, uses a system called data version control, uh, dvc.org. So a company called Iterative that's also open source. And uh, DVC allows you to define dependencies. Uh, so those dependencies can be really anything that you can generate a hash from. So anything you can generate you know, a unique string from. Um, and most uh, Biobricks have some sort of dependency on a website or on a resource that's downloaded um, from the authority. And that way, like if the, if the resource is stored on FTP server, like many of the NCBI resources, when that data changes, the brick actually knows that the data changed. And so the pipeline has to run again for the updated data. That's how we try to maintain up-to-date data. We're still figuring out the versioning aspect. So you could say, I want to download the version of the data from a year ago, a day ago, and all of that will help with reproducibility of uh, analytics tools that are built on those resources. Okay, thank you. Great, very interesting work, Tom. Uh, in the last uh, in the last minute, uh, can you tell us how how far are you from uh, actually having the system being live? And when I look at that code, I'm not a coder. I, I get a little bit intimidated by all these uh, these lines. Uh, are you planning to do uh, an interface that would be more user friendly and uh, 
and what is uh, are there any systems right now that could be uh, could be considered your competition or something that you're building on is there yeah. something that i could do now basically? so just two two comments on that first off so we're the developers of sysrev.com which has thousands of these projects on on the site right now um, all of those projects are going to be moved over to srvc um, and then the user interface will be very familiar, will be very similar to what SysRev already is. Uh, so that system will probably go live uh, in beta in, in the next one to two weeks. Uh, so you'll have a very user-friendly remote system for using SRVC. Um, Fabrix is live and available right now. To your latter comment, um, you know, the, the ecosystem of document review tools is a really interesting one. Uh, there are a surprising number of document review tools and uh, Whenever someone has a new idea about how to build, you know, a new way of doing document review, um, you know, they either have to convince one of those developers to add that feature, or what happens surprisingly frequently is they have to build an entirely new review platform. So you get these new review platforms coming up all the time that are funded by mostly government resources, I would guess. Um, so SRBC is really uh, is really a big change in that space, and we hope we can get those people interested because. SRVC has all the machinery for running this kind of platform, but you can add your own review stages. So you come up with this new protocol for doing systematic review that can be put into code. You just build a new, another review stage in SRVC. And um, the whole thing is open source and free and you can own that review stage or you know, sell it, keep it open source, closed source, whatever you wanna do. So for, okay. for the people who really care about open data, fair data, uh, I don't think you can do that on a closed platform. And um, I think SRVC is, uh, or an alternative approach to the same thing mm -hmm. is the only solution. You need to have an open source review system for this. So I hope other people agree. And if you want to talk to me about it, uh, you can ping me at tom at insilica.co, I'll put that in the chat or, uh, yeah, or find me some other way. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. You're certainly uh, welcome to uh, to contact us at EBTC and we'll put you in touch with any of the speakers. Uh, and also if you have, if you have any um, any ideas for future webinars, also please do get in touch. Um, thank you so much uh, to Javier and to Tom and Sebastian for for their talks, and we're looking forward to to staying engaged and staying in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.